and welcome to the Daiwa Anglo-Japanese Foundation. Uh, my name is Jason James, I, I run the foundation, but I won't be uh, talking or chairing or anything today. Um, so today, uh, we, we've got the exhibition, which I hope many of you have seen, uh, which is by Carl Randall, uh, sitting here. And I'll just give a, a brief introduction to Carl and to Andrew Stahl, who will be talking with him uh, this evening about his work. Uh, now, we have a particular um, relationship with Carl because he is a Daiwa scholar. Uh, in other words, uh, he went on our scholarship program in which he sent uh, young university graduates to Japan for 18 months, all expenses paid, um, train them intensively in Japanese language, and then try and plug them in uh, to the relevant networks for whatever their career field happens to be. It's by no means always art. In fact, art is, is relatively unusual for Daiwa scholars. So we know Carl very well, uh, and we're particularly pleased to have his exhibition on at the moment. And I must say, it's been, I think, about the most popular solo exhibition that we've had in the two and a half years I've been at this foundation, quite a, quite a large number of visitors. So as well as being a, a Daiwa scholar, uh, Carl is a graduate uh, of the Slade School of Fine Art um, and the Prince's Drawing School in London. Um, and while he was in Japan, I think after our scholarship, uh, he got a, a master's and a doctorate in fine art at the Tokyo University of Fine Art. Um, and he won the Nomura Prize uh, for his uh, graduation, uh, doctorate graduation exhibition there. Um, and uh, more recently, he had a, an exhibition at the National Portrait Gallery last year, which I saw, it was really great. Um, and that was the result of winning the BP Travel Award, yeah. is that correct? So that's Carl. Uh, and Andrew is uh, the head of undergraduate painting and director of undergraduate studies at the Slade School of Fine Art uh, at UCL. So Carl is one of his former students. Um, and Andrew is himself, of course, also an artist. And I think one of the things they have in common is the interest in cultural differences or the, the sense of being in a, in a different place. Um, and uh, I think since I don't know all that much about it, I'll just leave my comments at that at the moment. I think what we're going to do this evening is that Carl will give a brief five minute or so introduction and show you a few slides, um, and then after that it will be a, a discussion between the two of them, and there'll be opportunities for uh, the audience to ask questions later on. So over to you, Carl. Well, thank you very much for coming, everyone. Um, I that the tube strike was called up, so we could all get here. Um, well, um, I'll just say, I'll just start by thanking Dai also for not only hosting this exhibition, but sending me to Japan for um, 19 months in 2003. And um, if any of you have an interest in Japan, Japanese culture and language, I'd, I'd highly recommend their, their scholarship. Um, yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll just talk for a few minutes. Um, and then I'll talk with Andrew about my work. Um, as Jason said, some of you may have seen my work at the National Portrait Gallery last summer. That, that work was mainly about um, this thing called the Tokaido Highway, running from Kyoto to Tokyo. Um, kind of responses to urban and rural Japan in general. So the, this exhibition is mainly focused on Tokyo, um, the people and places that I... Um, it's my, my personal response to the people and places of Tokyo, and um, yeah, I mean, in my opinion, Tokyo is a, it's a, it's a kind of lifetime of inspiration for artists. Um, it, it has everything you, I don't know how many of you have been there, it has everything you'd want out of a, a large city. It has a strange combination of um, kind of crowdedness and, and busyness and kind of density. But also, I also found Tokyo actually quite a calm city in a, in a strange way. And I think that's related to, not to generalize, but it's possibly related to behavior, which I think is, which does differ from the UK. I think there's, there's more a sense of order to behavior I found in Japan. And um, there's also um, <coughs> possibly related to other aspects like safety. Japan's an incredibly safe place, I found, during the 10 years I was there. Um, one story I have is I, uh, I, I dropped a 100 yen coin in a convenience store, that's about 60 pence, and 
I, I didn't know I dropped it, and then I went back about two weeks later, and they had, had wrapped it up in a piece of paper, and kind of said, oh, you dropped this two weeks ago, which is amazing for a big city, really. It's never happened in London. Um, another, another time I bought a, uh, I bought some pencils and erasers and, and paper from an art store, and um, I got home, and I didn't have the bag with me anymore, and I thought I had left it on the, on the train. But anyway, about three months later, um, I left it, it turned out I left it in a restaurant. About three months later, I returned to the same restaurant and I sat down and the waiter came over. I said, you left this bag here three months ago. And not a thing was missing, not a single pencil. So that was, I mean, it's, I really enjoyed living in Tokyo for um, various reasons, what, safety being one of them. And um, yeah, the, uh, it, 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 it's, there's an amazing amount of inspiration there for, for artists generally. Um, if I can just quickly flick here, I had the honor of meeting a writer called Donald Ritchie, who has written a lot of books about Japan. And um, he spent a lot of his life writing about Tokyo and Japanese culture, and that, that was a kind of lifetime of work for him. And um, yeah, that's the portrait of him. So I'm going to just quickly talk about my process, and then we'll go over to Andrew. I always work from life. I, I never use photographs when I'm painting people. I think I always find it more enjoyable to sit with a person rather than a, a piece of paper. I mean, a, piece, a photograph's just basically, a, I find anyway, a, a piece of paper with some chemicals arranged on it to resemble the, per, the thing that the camera was pointed at. And when it, wherever possible, I think it's better to get the model in. And so, for example, the large painting downstairs, all. All of those people came one by one to the studio to sit for me. Um, just quickly flip through these. Yeah, there's about 200 people in there. So it's about three hours each head. Um, and yeah, just flip through these. That's me there. <laughs> So I probably painted about a thousand people when I was in Japan. Um, I talk now about the. I, I, I often work from sketches. I, I have an idea in my head and I make a, I make a very quick uh, thumbnail sketch, and then I'll develop that later into a, a fully kind of realized painting. So this is a uh, sketch for the previous painting, which is, I just showed you. So this is just getting it out of my head onto a piece of paper, and then I'll kind of fiddle around with it and get it onto the, get it into the final design. This painting here, which is downstairs, this was the original sketch, and the one before that was this. And I think I did. I think I did this from memory. I was on the train. I tried to memorize it, and then I, I got home and did this. And also a lot of sketches, kind of sitting, commuting in and out of London, kind of quick line drawings. That were related to the previous painting. This painting here, that's the sketch for that. So I only, I just do them in line and then kind of work out the light and darks later. This painting here, this is a, an ink drawing for that painting. This one here, that's the sketch for that. So it's just to show, it's kind of something, that's the tripping that that painting's part of. It's just to show something behind the paintings rather than, because you often see the fully finished painting without any process behind it. There's a fair bit of process there. So it starts with a, a kind of initial sketch. Um, a drawing for that. So this is just a tiny little drawing. And I, don't, I don't really know, when I do these drawings, I don't really know where they'll go, whether they end up as a fully finished painting or not. They're just trying to get it out of my head, really. And it, uh, this one was turned into a painting. This was the, this is an initial idea I had for a sushi um, restaurant, but it just seemed a bit too complicated. And um, I didn't have time either to do it because this was for the travel award, so I went with the previous, um, more simple version. This one here, where's the sketch for that? That's oh, disappeared, sorry. The Shibuya drawing that you may have seen at the Portrait Gallery, This I did this years ago um, at a place called the Prince's Drawing School. And so I was thinking I wanted to make a composition of Shibuya with figures in the foreground and the cityscape behind. So this, this drawing that I did years ago kind of came into my head. So I started that, I, I used that as a starting point and then kind of made a bit of collage. 
with cutting things out, and I eventually ended up with the final thing, which is that. And uh, this drawing here, that's the initial sketch. Very quick, again, I didn't know this would be turned into a painting. Some, a lot of them just go, you know, and they, they don't go anywhere, or I don't have, have, have time to develop them. This, this is the kind of initial kind of spark in my head. I think I did this in a cafe, just sitting, looking out the window. And that's the, um, so when I, when I start a painting, it's kind of partially planned and partially not planned. Um, and that's to keep the process kind of interesting as I'm doing it. So I knew there was going to be cityscape behind here, but I didn't know what, kind of exactly what it would look like. So I painted lots of faces at the bottom, and then I thought to myself, you know, I'm going to have to start on the top. And then, then I just put the buildings on the top. So that's, I kind of have some of it planned and some of it not planned. And this painting here, um, I think this is about as much as I had planned. I just knew I wanted two figures in the foreground, one reading a newspaper, and two figures on the side. So I got to this point, and I, I, I kind of, I was inventing from, from then. So I, I get a skeleton <laughs> of the picture decided, what will go in it, but the, but the details, the flesh of it, I, um, I decide as I'm painting it. And I usually paint it in stages, so that's an early stage, a bit more, and it ends up like that. Same with the noodle bar one. <laughs> I showed the line drawing earlier, but um, I hadn't. I, I didn't know about the lights and darks in this painting. Um, I was just inventing it. I was going. So if you see the figure at the bottom here, his face, his face is very bright. So I painted that in, and then I realised actually the table is going to have to be quite light in order to. It, it just made sense to have the table quite bright rather than dark. So I had to get rid of the. I knew that. I knew that face would be too bright then, so I painted him in dark. So it's kind of thing, so you, I had the major things decided, but the light and dark of this painting, I was just kind of making it up as I went along, really. And the top, you can see originally I had a menu on the top, and um, it, there was nothing new. It was kind of flatness against flatness that didn't really work for me. I, 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 feel, I felt like I needed something to contrast with the flat table, so I, I put the cityscape in, um, which was just invented really. It wasn't part of the actual noodle bar. It's based on a real noodle bar, but the cityscape is invented. That looks more like a real noodle bar, but compositionally, I, I spent a long time trying to get the composition right and quite a strong design, and the menu just didn't work, so I got rid of it. Oh, I don't know why that appeared now, it's just <coughs> misbehaving. Just quickly, and then we go on to Andrew. I paint, when I paint in colour, I paint black and white first, and then I put colour on top of it. And that's because I, I feel as though I can get more kind of nuanced um, flesh tones when I, when I paint it in black and white first. Um, yeah. I mean, it's not what all painters do, but I find it works for me. So originally that looked like that. Kind of separating tone from colour then rather than thinking about the, the both at the same time. And this one looked like that. So yeah, let's 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 go over to Andrew and just have a little chat with Andrew. Sure. Yeah. Just bring us over here and Hello everyone. Uh, um so yeah, I've got a few questions to ask, but the first thing I'd like to say actually is you know coming back here again to see the show you know i'm i'm struck by actually it's the the beauty of it and its precision and the touch and if you look at it very closely it's very kind of very delicate and sensitive in the way it's painted that's the first thing and then the other thing i was struck at this time which didn't occur to me i was suddenly started thinking of people like like um Renaissance about faces staring out of altar pieces like Duccio's Meister, mm. and these saints sort of stare at you. So there's this, and, and a lot of your actually the figures avoid the eye contact, and they're sort of looking down, looking sideways. But there's that feeling of presence, and I think it's a very, really beautiful, impressive show, fantastic, and um, really exciting to see it. But I think that, that just to go back. Okay, I think there's also kind of, by the way, sort of euphoria about it. Mm -hmm. But there's, right. there's also maybe a sense of distance. <clears throat> I get the feeling that grey is kind of to keep an emotional distance. Right. Or, you know, maybe as somebody going to 
a foreign country, you're slightly outsider. Yeah. And I remember the very interesting thing is, as a student, and I don't, I mean, you were there a long time ago at the Slade. Yeah. You don't remember many people's work. Yeah. I remember these paintings you made of houses, and you were standing outside a house, and there was a light. I think I've got some here. There was a light in a bedroom. It was like, again, you were outside the house. Yeah. Again, the sense of being outside, mm. which in a way, a bit mirrors, you know, I think, the kind of travel that you're doing. Uh -huh. in those. So I don't know how you felt, but that's what I'm going to ask you. But the first question I'm going to, and I thought those were really strong paintings you made at that mm. time. Thanks. You were always in the street, and there was a warm light inside, and you know. So I want to ask you, why, I mean, you know, you left the Slade, or whatever. Why did you go to Japan? What attracted you there in the first place? Um, and did you, did you learn <coughs> Japanese before you go? What when? I didn't learn Japanese before I went. Um, I didn't know. I, I didn't. Even, I didn't know any any language at all. Um, why did I go to Japan? I think the most basic, the first thing I have to say about that was it was just a kind of. Um, I wanted to see a bit of the world, and I wanted to travel. And um, my my logic was, if if I was going to go and live abroad, I, I'd like to go somewhere completely different. And. I mean, I could have went to France or Ireland, and I'm sure they've got interesting <coughs> cultures, but still felt a bit too close, and it didn't seem to have the kind of sense of adventure or, or kind of uh, otherness that, that uh, Japan had. So that was the reason. Um, that was one of the reasons. Uh, did you know any Japanese people? I did, yeah. I In, in London, I, um, I had a few Japanese friends, and I think just um, they were very good ambassadors for Japan. They were... They were kind of they were, speaking with them. It made them made me very interested in going there. Um, it's difficult to say why you're, why you're interested in certain things and not others. But and then I researched it a, a bit myself, and I, it seemed to kind of combine certain things that seemed quite appealing. Um, I wasn't. I was. I was interested in a place. I was interested in India as well at the time, actually. But and I spoke with. Other, I had friends who had visited there. And it seemed like a good place to go, but I didn't know many people that had went to Japan. And it seemed like a very kind of it didn't seem didn't seem like the obvious place for a painter. And I I, I think it's important as an artist to try and kind of find your own route and not copy what other people are doing. And kind of at the time I'd finished the Slade and I thought maybe I'd apply for the Royal College of Art or Royal Academy or something and get involved with the London art scene. But it didn't really appeal to me that much. So I, to try to forge your own route. Uh, kind of is important and going to Japan for me was kind of part of that. It, um, I didn't know any other painters that had done it. It seemed like a really exciting, interesting thing to do. Um, yeah, but I guess that doesn't really explain why Japan itself. I think it kind of it seemed to combine kind of things like the old and new. Um, when you're in Tokyo you see kind of people wearing kimonos or yukatas combined with very modern things like kind of traditional shrines and temples sitting right next to skyscrapers or cherry blossoms, kind of a bit cliché really, but that kind of thing appealed to me. Next, traditional Japanese gardens right next to office blocks, that, that, that kind of thing appealed to me. But it's, Japan seemed to have a, although I'd never been at the time, it seemed to have a very strong kind of visual culture that seemed to, I don't know, the level of dedication to visual things. Um, and I found this was true when I was in Japan. It seems. It seems there's a higher level of dedication to visual things than the UK. Um, Did you, I mean, was it like a, I mean, it all sounds thing is it must have been a massive adventure. Yeah. You never, I mean, yeah. and I think that communicates, you know, it's right. an adventure, it's very different just in terms of even the architecture, the, yeah. the cutlery, the colours, everything is, is very different. I remember yeah. the first time I went there, just going in a supermarket, yeah. there's a whole different range of colours and stuff. And yeah. So it's like the ordinary becomes extraordinary. Yeah. So yeah. you walk in, so something that you take for granted in England, you look, and I'm sure it's the same for mm. Japanese people when they come here, mm. that there's this sense, it's so different, yeah. that everything quite ordinary comes extraordinary. So, you know... I'd like you to say something about when you when you first arrived there. What was what happened? <coughs> um, what happened? I got, off the plane, <laughs> got off the plane. Got off the plane. Got to the hotel and checked. You go to a hotel. Had some to eat. Sorry, no. I I um I it was very it was very really exciting. Very exciting. It was kind of 
it was very stimulating. I don't know if it's something about arriving right in the middle of Tokyo as opposed to the countryside, but there's a kind of almost an kind of overload of senses when you arrive in Tokyo, visually and and also kind of the sounds. Everything's different. The sounds, the the kind of buildings. Every everything has no associations. It's almost like you're kind of I don't know, a newborn baby or something when you arrive, because you have no memories and no associations with anything. Whereas I think if you're in Europe, especially in the UK, you, you kind of always, always reminds me of something, your, your upbringing or your, your education or whatever. But um, yeah, it's just very, very new and, and, and very exciting. Yeah. So, yeah. so I mean, did you, did you think it kind of, I mean, there's, there's I think, a slight sense of loneliness as well. In the painting? Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. You, are, you know, you talked about the otherness. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. Walking I, down the streets, did you feel, how long did it take you to feel kind of part? I mean, you, you ended up staying there 10 years. Yeah. Which is extraordinary. Yeah. It's amazing. Right. How did that yeah. sort of process? Um, yeah, I don't know. What's the question? Is it, is it, um, <laughs> is this? Uh, yes. How, yeah. How, how, yeah. I mean, more about you, how you, you never, felt. I, you never really feel part of things, really, even after 10 years. You, all, you always feel slightly on the outside. But I always find that helpful as an artist, because you're not really part of things, and you kind of observe things as, a, as an observer. And you, you don't have any strong kind of emotional associations with things, really, or negative reactions and things. So you're always, I mean, it's a, it's a cliche thing, really, the artist is the outsider. But it is kind of true a bit. You're on the outside, you're observing things. Um, you're recording things, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so to move on to another question. Okay, what do you think, in all these work, what do you think your primary concerns are? What's your central concerns? Right, yeah, my central concerns. Um, I can give you an example. It could be a portrait of the city. Let me just, uh, you know, I, I mean, that's yeah. how it looks to Why me. It doesn't look like individual portraits. Why don't you tell me what you think my son is going to I can tell you what I think. Okay. Okay. I've, I've written, I think, for example, I think it's a portrait of the city and a portrait of that being an outsider. Again, I think that's something which a lot of artists have, as you say. Mm. I think it's about you're marveling at the ordinary. Mm being slightly different. Yeah. I think you use grey to give emotional distance, actually. Uh -huh. I think um, it's sort of parallel to some kind of sense of distance you feel. And, and I, I'm interested about the distortions, the flatness. Mm. You know, I notice in some the head is much bigger than you have a, a drop of space and there's a really small head or small mm. figure. Mm -hmm. So you're playing with those kind of things. Yeah. I think they're playful in that way. Um, I think they're quite formal as well, but you know, no. To me, it, it looks like you are trying to to portray a, a, a very exciting metropolitan world, city, yeah. Yeah. people. One, one that you feel slightly outside, which enables you to kind of be there. I mean, the film of you just mm -hmm. drawing people in the thing to me is is really extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, you know that. They, you're just sitting there, and did they know you? They, they, they were going to, you were going to draw them. Um, yeah, well, not on trains and things, but I think the noodle bar when we we, we, we went in there and say, hey, I'm from this university. We're doing a short film. Short film. They, they were fine with it. Yeah. Now, some people may not have seen the film. Um, it's downstairs. It's a video. Yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting. Mm. So if I can you just, I'll just go back to your question then. What's yeah, my, it's what my concerns. Concerns. You put it back to me, but I'm yeah. going to be asking you that question. All right. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I think I think um, probably the best way to start answering that question is the idea of documentation. I think I, I see a lot of what I do really is, is just kind of documents. Really, um, there, there are a lot of there are a lot of photographers that go to Japan and document Japan, and there's movie makers. But there's not many painters I found. In fact, you know, I don't know of any other painters really that are really very seriously trying to to pick modern Japan. You get kind of painters that are interested in Kyoto and very kind of big, kind of cheesy, you know, traditional things, which doesn't interest me. But my what I saw I was doing, I, it was almost like a a documentary um, journalist or reporter. So going to Japan, recording it, and then bringing it back and showing it to people. So that, I think that my concern was documenting Japan um, through the eyes of a visiting 
foreign artists. I think that was my main thing, really. Um, yeah, that, that, and I think you can see it in... Um, I've got, I have to flip through some slides here. But uh, I think the most obvious document thing I did was some survivors of the atomic bomb in Hiroshima. And um, they, were, they were probably the most pure document. I'll have to flip through some slides here, sorry. And they were, they were inspired by a, a writer called John Hersey, who, who um, wrote a book called Hiroshima and interviewed six survivors just as, after the atomic bomb had dropped. And he, his language is very direct in that it, it wasn't flowery, it wasn't trying to kind of pull at the heartstrings. And I, I thought it'd be interesting to go uh, do a, a visual equivalent of his book just documenting the, the people that I met, the survivors, through drawing. Um, and that, I just see that as pure, I don't even see that as art actually, I just see that as document. Um, I can't find them, sorry, they'll come, come here eventually. But, um, oh here they are, there, there I, just, I see these as document, I don't, I don't even see them as art. It's just documenting a community of people that will, uh, that will kind of be dead in 10 years or so. And in, in one way or another, the, the, um, a lot of my other paintings I just see as document as well, but with a sense of placefulness, kind of playing with space, playing with proportion. What about the dramatic? Not so much these. Go back, I, yeah. What about, you know, there seems to be, I mean, when you say that you work from life, I mean, there are moments, mm -hmm. you capture moments where people are leaning forward or doing something. So obviously yeah. that's not from life. But um, it it's a memory. Okay. But it's a memory. Isn't yeah. Because obviously they're not going to stay like that. No, but the model is that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so I think there's something dramatic. Some some of your paintings, for me, I mean, I'm exaggerating slightly, but they have a yeah. kind of Night of the Living Dead feeling. All right. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else thinks that, but I think they have a sort of do do, you know, slightly zombie feel. I really enjoy that. I think that dramatic side is really really interesting in them and quite. Special, right? I just um, remembered my other central concern. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> I can just mention that at this good. point. Sorry, the uh, it, it, this what I'm interested in a lot of these paintings is the idea of urban isolation, people um, occupying the same close physical space as you do in cities. You're kind of pushed up against people on trains and, and streets and things, but psychologically being quite separate, very separate, kind of in your own little sphere. So I think a lot of these paintings. Um, try to reflect that. Very ordinary scenes, as Andrew said earlier, the, the extraordinary ordinary, is that what you said? Yeah. Um, but <coughs> kind of trying to pick up with them on this, people like Edward Hopper, for example, was very good at that, and I'm a big fan of Edward Hopper. I was, I was interested in that idea, yeah. And I'm not saying that's exclusive to Tokyo, actually. I think you get that in a lot of big cities, but maybe perhaps because of the sheer size of Tokyo, um, you can kind of feel it a bit. Kind of I think you get it in, in London as well. York, in the yeah, tube, you, do, you know, yeah. you sit, yeah. people sit there really close to you, and yeah. they're staring ahead. And you don't. Yeah. yeah, I think that comes across. That's um, another central. But country. it's very, very dense city, Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. So, can you say something about why you make them the way you do? Why do you fall short on the space? Why do you flatten them? Why, why? You talked about your process, but yeah. you make these decisions that are quite um, dramatic and are quite strange right. and very interesting. Right. Um, so can you say... Maybe I'll just find a picture of that. And that. by the way, I don't think there's an answer to everything. I think yeah. you can answer some questions when you talk about art and the other things that are kind of poetic decisions. Right. So I'm not expecting... But there might be an answer that you, you can explain. Well, I think it's... I'm trying to find the noodle bar picture. I think it's um, even that one. Well, there's no there's no real distortion in that thing. I think that's quite real, really. Okay. Yeah. 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 Anyway, we'll come. I can't see. We'll come to it sooner or later. Let's get the, let's get the subway one way. But it's, it's basically to make things more interesting, really, for me as well. Because um, I I've, I've got to look at the paintings as well. I, what I try to do is just make a painting, painting that interests me, and hopefully it'll interest other people also. And I think that's what probably all artists do, really. Um, I don't I don't really paint them. Of course, I paint them from other people to look at, but I'm painting things that interest me. But I, I flatten the space. If I think if you're a painter, you kind of you have the privilege of, of changing things. Like perhaps it's not as easy with photography or movie making or whatever. Um, 
I mean, I think and that's why, actually, at, at, why this time, looking, I was thinking of Siennese painting, when they changed perspective, right. you could look in a window on one side of the building and then the other, and again, yeah. and then there's that really interesting talk that Hotney gave about, a, uh, actually it was a Chinese scroll, I think, how you can see through one side of the house yeah. and through the other, right. because of the distortion. I yeah. sort of feel you're doing something a bit like that. Right. I, I, um, I, I, think I think it's to create a kind of tension. I, I usually try and paint the people quite real. By flattening. But go, go back one. It's really interesting because, for example, the reason I think you have an East Asian perspective there yeah. is the figures in the front are almost the same size as the ones at the top of the painting. Right. And that's a very traditional. Yeah. And used in Japanese a lot, Japanese prints and Japanese things a lot, right. and Chinese yeah. and Korean, where right. the, the top things at the top are further away, they're not necessarily smaller. Mm -hmm. So that kind of yeah. formal thing you're using a lot, I noticed. So yeah. right. I wonder if that's conscious or whether no, that somehow entered. I think it's entered, it probably entered um, indirectly. I, I, no, I, I, I mean, I really like. Um, I really like uh, Japanese prints and Japanese drawings. That was that was another reason I wanted to go to Japan. Actually, since a teenager, I was very interested in Japanese drawings and and Hokusai, Hiroshige, Utamaro, kind of woodblock prints. So that was my initial relationship with Japan. Actually, since the early teens, and um, that kind of image in, of Japan stayed in my mind, and that possibly influenced me wanting to go there. I mean, yeah. I mean, but, um, that kind of it brings, um, brings me to another question, okay, yeah. as artists, you know, we're living in a, disc a massive discourse and who we look at, we're part of a chain of, we're, we're part of a world mm -hmm. and, and we're part of a context, yeah. and how do you place yourself? Well, who do you look at mainly? You've talked about Hopper, of course, uh, who are, I mean, I can think, of, I've, I've got all sorts of people I think you, can, you look at, but right. I'm interested to know whether they're the same, actually. I think the, the two main artists that I think have influenced me are the American painter Edward Hopper yeah. uh, and, and the English painter Stanley Spencer. And Spencer was actually the reason I wanted to go to Slade in, in the first place, I was a big fan of him. And um, Edward Hopper, for his very powerful depictions of cities, um, kind of amazing. Painters. And the mood. I yeah, mean, the mood. I think you, yeah. your, your mood connects right. to Hopper, okay. definitely. Right. Well, you, yeah, I think in a painting like that, you can probably see the influence a bit. Though I, 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 did, I wasn't consciously trying to show it. So yeah, Hopper for his kind of depictions of urban alienation, kind of large cities, the feeling of being in a large contemporary city, and also for his, his eye for the abstract, I think. He's kind of large blocks of color and geometry. Um, and Spencer, for similar reasons, actually, kind of these quirky, distorted views of, of everyday life combining people with places. But also, I think Spencer has an amazing eye for um, pattern making, kind of reducing life to, reducing the world around him to simple patterns. I think I think they both have that relation. But there's also people like the early Flemish painters, Roger van der Weyden and uh, Hans Memling. Spencer, kind of group. Spencer also plays with something, he does things like places yeah. figure in space, plays with perspective yeah. a lot as well. But you know, he, he died in 1959 or something yeah. like that. What about more recent, what about someone like Ron Muick? Ron Muick I'm a big fan of, yeah. He's probably my favorite contemporary sculptor. The way he plays with scale. And the, the, the eyes, the face, yeah. the, the presence. Yeah. The, I, I mean, kind of very yeah. analytical. But I think the painters I like, the new objectivity painters, the German like Otto Dix, um, Christian Schad, and the early Flemish painters, and also early Freud, not particularly his later stuff, but early for you. Very, and, what, and Ron Muick as well, I think what they all have is this very studied, precise, analytical um, study of things, the way, they, with the way they make them, paint them or sculpt them, but they can kind of combine it with a, a slightly distorted view of the world, um, with kind of psychological elements. And I think all of those painters, in my opinion, have all of that, have those similarities. I think they, yeah, I think they're possibly influence me. So painters that combine people with places, figure with painters that have a very analytical approach to painting, but have a, have a, have a quite a distorted view of things, are, are, are people I like. Yeah. You mentioned to me before, say, Alex Katz, I think. Yeah, Alex Katz, yeah. No, Peter not, Doig. Peter Doig, yeah. Alex, I love Alex Katz and Peter Doig, but I wouldn't, I don't, I don't feel as influence me no. at all. No. 
you know, great painters, but I could never paint like that. And, um, and I think there you can see in the, that that one in yeah. the on send picture, yeah. you can see how the head at the oh, back. Yeah. <coughs> so I was going to go to the large view of it, but the head at the back yeah. is is bigger than the head at the front. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, that sort of playing with space yeah. is, I think, the, the, what makes them really interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of the things that makes them really interesting. kind of pattern making, really. I, I, uh, I'm interested in tapestries and textiles and this kind of flattening of things. But also, because you are very precise yeah. and very convincing, and there's a real sense of presence yeah. in the figures, actually, somehow, despite the fact you distort the space, mm. you don't lessen the reality or sense of presence or of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I yeah. think that's a real credit to you, that intensity. Yeah. yeah. So it doesn't matter. You sort of believe it's believable even yeah. if you play with space. Yeah, well that's again you're playing very much in something like this. Yeah. You see I think that's the most exciting I mean, I think if you if you made them really kind of um, conventional mm -hmm. music really conventional kind of perspective I think they'd be much less con less interesting yeah I, think, I agree yeah I think it's fantastic the way yeah. you play like that I mean this one was influenced by Pac-Man <laughs> <laughs> well, so I have a broad range of influences but that's like yeah. early Flemish painting but that's what's so interesting I mean I notice in Japan a lot I mean we have quite a few Japanese um, students obviously yeah. at the Slade and I notice I love the way quite often they'll combine like a very serious Portrait with something, some cartoon aspect from Japanese cartoon yeah. or manga or something that will, will come in. So I think that's the other thing about Japan. I don't think um, that comes across in your painting. I don't think there's a sort of sacredness about source or no. you know. No, I don't think there should be a sacredness. And, and I think that's terrific. Yeah. And I think that comes across I as well. I think you use whatever you want, whether that's watching TV, watching kind of a, a drama or. Chacho or 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 early Flemish painting or Renaissance. I think it all goes in okay. in your head, and it it should you should use it all. I think. Really. Okay, so I'm going to ask you another question. Okay, yeah. so you're in England and yeah. you get in a plane and you arrive in Japan yeah. like that, and it's surrounded by lots of new information, new images, new things, and I mean is. I mean, to me, the one of the most exciting things about that kind of cultural transcultural leap, and that's more and more, and it's. Japanese people coming here, going mm. to China, is the fact that you've got all this new stuff, new information that you can use in your work. Mm. So, mm. and so there's a sort of exchange. So in a way, art becomes like an international language of exchange. Mm. Mm -hmm. Do you do you kind of what would happen if you went somewhere else? I don't know. That's an interesting question. Um, I got a lot out of being in Japan. Um, a lot of, I mean, I think there's a lifetime of inspiration in Japan, really. But it'd be interesting to see where, you know, if I went to other countries, what, what kind of work I would make. I'd be, I'd be interested in doing that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's interesting. Okay, so, okay, what? Well, the other question. The, this is a question we discussed beforehand. I was going to ask you, and um, yeah. I think, um, what do you feel about portraiture? You're, you've been in National Portrait Gallery. <coughs> Do yeah. you see yourself as a portrait painter? Um, no, I don't. No, I'd have to say no. I, I think I do a bit more than... I'd like to think I do more than portraiture. It's, um, I think it's kind of people and places together. The portraits of places as much as the portraits of people, really. I think it's a bit limiting to call myself a portrait painter. I just think, don't think it's very accurate to call myself a portrait painter. And I don't... I'm not sure how, I, how interested I am in the, the kind of single portrait of a face on a canvas trying to show the sitter's personality or likeness. Um, and I don't think that's my strength. I think there's very, very few painters that can do that very, very well and tell a story with one head. I think Croy could do it. There's a couple of other painters I know that could do it. Um, but I don't, I don't feel as though that's my, what, what I'm interested in, really. It's, it's, it's people and places together. Um, although the very large group portraits with all the heads, I do see that as group portraiture, really. Mm -hmm. They're portraits of of crowds, the, the portraits of crowds. Um, to me, they, they don't seem to be anywhere near what would be called conventional portraits. No, so well, yeah. To me, thank goodness. And to yeah. me, they're much more about describing a mood or atmosphere. Right. And, you know, I remember like crossing like a road in Japan and seeing lots, hundreds of people moving towards me and passing and mm -hmm. the sense of, you know, the continual mm. passing people. I, I don't mm. feel that you're actually describing, mm. I mean, but the interesting thing is, you are managing, I think, to make them look like individuals. They're not yeah, yeah. kind of, you're not using yeah. some kind of formulaic head. Yeah. I mean, that looks like somebody. It real. is somebody. 
<laughs> you know, they're not. They're not. For me, they don't look like a kind of cliched idea of a no, person at no. all. Well, that's why so I mean, in that way, yeah. they connect to portraiture. In yeah. Every, yeah. I mean, that's a portrait in a way, that image. It's yeah. a portrait of a, pla a person in a place. Yeah. So it's a, it's a portrait of a place and a person. And that's the reason I always get the models in as well, because mm. they need to look convincing, really, I think. But, I but ult ultimately, that. you know, whether or not you see yourself... I mean, that's a semantic question, really. Mm -hmm. It's not that interesting because there's a whole range, you go near it. Mm. Okay, I mean, I don't think we should talk that much, but I want to ask you yeah. just before, just a couple of questions, okay, more. Um, who do you think your audience is? Okay, you're a British person going to Japan. Yeah. You're showing back here. Yeah. I know you've had shows in Japan, but yeah. do you have a particular, you, is it for the world, or is it, are you equal interested in the British and Japanese audience? Who do you, who do you I felt when I, when I was painting all these works, I felt as though I was, I was painting for a Western audience. And I think that relates back to the idea of documentation and this idea of, of being a kind of reporter or kind of going over there and, and documenting and reporting things and bringing it back. So that was always my intention, to, to show things here, really. And if, if Japanese people look like my paintings, I, uh, that's really great. This is what I wanted to ask yeah. because, I mean... And I had a... So yeah. I, had, I think one of the best comments I had was a couple I randomly bumped into in the, at the Paul Ray Gallery who said before they um, saw the name on the wall they thought the paintings were by, by Japanese artists and I really like that because I think it shows that I possibly had some understanding of the culture and it wasn't just surface unless they were just trying to flatter me. I do, uh, the Japanese people I know who've looked at your painting respond very, very, you know, very, very interested in it. Yeah. I mean, you know, I wasn't sure that what their reaction would be. Um, but um, yeah. that's very interesting. So, what about what about the future? Um, What's what, how are you going to take you? You're you're in England now. Yeah. You've got all this information. Are you going to go on making Japanese influenced paintings? I'm, you, I'm working on. I'm doing a commission at the moment, kind of a fairly large painting of the Japanese scene because the the guy who's commissioning it wanted a Japanese scene. But um, I'm also working on a series of portraits of of. Um, of people that have kind of, con of different from different fields of people who have contributed to UK society. For example, David Mitchell is one of them. He who opened my show, and I'm placing them in London locations. So it'll be kind of London portraits, and I'm working on a. I'm hoping you get a group of them together for an exhibition. So I'm I'm working on. I'm I mean I'm not that keen. I'm talking about things I'm doing right now or how no, got, or what about, to start. But are you yeah. in, you're going to stay in London? Yeah. And so what about for the moment? So what about it? Okay, forget sort of individual commissions. But like, do you think now you'll focus that degree of fascination to London, or do you think you yeah, will? I, what will happen next? Or will that will you've got so much material? You said you know it was a light or a lifetime of material for yeah. you. Yeah. Do you think you will go on yeah. with this? Or, I mean, I think I it's fascinating think, yeah. what to do when you return. You right. know, yeah. I, I, yeah. At, at the moment, I'm, I'm working yeah. on these London portrait things, but you, I mean, you never know where it will take you. Really, I didn't know I'd be in Japan for ten years. It's extraordinary. So, yeah, yeah it, it, I think you just start something, and if you and it, you, then you see how much mileage it has. So I can't predict really where, where things where my work at the moment will go, but. Um, yeah, I'd like to keep connections with Japan. Really, it, it depends. It really depends what, if anything, appropriate comes my way, or you know, opportunities. And yeah, I mean, for example, I'd love to be, for example, love to be the arts and residence of the Olympics in 2020. But that, these things are decided by other people. Really, I, you know, I. So yeah, I'd love to keep connections. I have a show there this summer, from July to September, at the Ando Hiroshige Museum, where where these paintings will be. Exhibited alongside Hiroshige's original prints, um, and yeah, that's actually, yeah. No, that does answer uh, it. Please thank both of our speakers. <laughs>